morning we'll be looking at Mark, the 11th chapter, verses 20 through 26. And incidentally, some of you, if you need a Bible, there are Bibles under some of the uh, chairs, under some of the racks. Uh, if you see one by someone else and you need a Bible, just ask them to hand it to you, okay? You're always encouraged to uh, see what the Bible says. Uh, it's a great test because it's always better to see what the Bible says compared to what necessarily Bill says. Thanks a lot. <laughs> How do you know when you're praying a prayer of faith? How do you know when what you're praying is getting through to God? How do you know that what you're praying is God's will? How many of you pray? Good. One of the young men uh, recently in our youth group said, I don't think I've ever prayed. I wonder. If God were answering that question, how many of us have prayed <laughs> what he might say about our prayers? Now, here's the good news. God's not sitting up there grading your prayers, right? Thank God. And the fact is, is that there is no proper language for prayer. Uh, the Jews say you have to do it in, in Hebrew, right? And, and most every um, nationality, no, 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 our language is the best language. <laughs> but the fact is, there is no right language for prayer. I do think that there are some attitudes for prayer, and, and there are a variety of different postures of prayer. We're even going to learn about that near, near the end of our text this morning. But I don't even think there's a required specific position that you have to pray in. I think there's some value in us getting on our knees. That's why I've asked you to do it last week and this week again. I think sometimes serious things take us getting on our knees. I appreciate what Billy Graham did one day when he was praying over a friend, and a friend said that, you know, I was praying there with Bill and asked Billy to pray for me and all of a sudden I, I could barely understand Billy and I looked and Billy was flat on his face. Flat on his face. Because for him at that moment in order to beseech God he had to get completely laid out before God. In our text later we'll see that there's times that you stand and pray before God. So again, I don't think there's a specific posture that you have to have, and if you don't do that. And I guess I'm opening up something else with that. I don't believe that there's a magic formula that you have to use to pray. And here's an interesting one. Do you know that even non-believers get heard by God? God bless you. That God hears prayers? In fact, watch out. Because doesn't the scripture even warn us that there's some of us that will not be heard because our relationship's not right with our spouse? I believe there are some really interesting things about prayer. But this morning we're going to see that the most important thing is about is praying with Jesus. He's really talking to him. Please don't try to be eloquent when you pray. Because if you're trying to impress anybody, you're not going to be able to impress God. <laughs> and if you're trying to impre impress the rest of us, we're not worth it. <laughs> okay? Okay? Our prayers are to converse with this creator of the universe, the savior of the world, the one who died on a cross, who loves us so much that he sacrificed himself for us. Our prayers are to connect with him. By the way, you might want to evaluate your prayers on one thing. How much time do you spend talking when you're praying compared to how much time you spend listening? Here's a real danger. Too many of us simply go pray, dear Jesus, amen, and we leave. One of the simplest descriptions of prayer is that prayer is conversation conversation. How many of you like, please stand if you like talking to somebody where they do all the talking. 
I knew it, Joe. We're going to have to help your girls. <laughs> but really, do, do we like it if somebody else, they just do all the talking and, and we never get a word in edgewise? We never get to make a comment. We, we, we hear things and we, we think something and we, we, we want to respond. And, and maybe, maybe, get this one, maybe they're even asking us, well, what do you think? You know, do you think I should do this or do you think I should do this? And I've been really questioning this and I really would like your advice and your counsel. Uh, bye. How much of our praying is that way? You see, if you're really going to ask God something, do you believe he's going to answer? If you don't, why pray? Think about that. If you don't believe he's going to answer when you ask him a question, why ask it? Because God wants to respond. God wants to converse with you. Prayer. The title of the sermon is Prayer of Faith. In the morning, as they went out along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it. And it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Remember, Jesus came into Jerusalem. He looked around the city. He went into the temple. He made a lot, a lot of observations. He left the temple. He went back out to Bethany, just a couple miles outside of town. Probably back to Lazarus and Mary and Martha's house. He spends the night there in Bethany. He's up early praying, and probably because of that, he hasn't had anything to eat. He's hungry. And so he's heading back into Jerusalem, and up in Bethany are fig trees and palm trees. And he sees a fig tree that, oh, there's a fig tree that's got all the green leaves on it. Wonderful, because that is a sign that there's figs on the tree. Figs don't, fig trees don't grow their leaves until the figs. The figs grow before the leaves. Most trees, it's the other way around, right? Have you seen it up here? The, the leaves grow out, and then the fruit comes. In this case, no, it was the figs, then the, then the leaves. And so Jesus, oh, great. So he walks up to the tree, and he gets ready to take a fig off the tree, and there's nothing there. And he curses the tree. Incidentally, it's the first that I know of miracle where it's a negative miracle that Jesus performed. All the others. He starts with uh, the wine that, or excuse me, the water that he turns into wine at the marriage feast. And then he starts healing people and he's casting out demons. He walks on the water. He calms storms. Uh, he feeds thousands with just a little bit of bread and fish. Does incredible things, doesn't he? And in fact, just before he came up to Jerusalem, one of the guys who's along with him is a blind man named Bartimaeus, whom he gave his eyesight back to him. And Barnabas is right there with the crowd walking into Jerusalem with Jesus and celebrating the fact that he can see. And that's the miracles that these people have all been hearing of, seeing, witnessing. And Jesus is incredible. But this time now, he takes this tree and he says, no, you're not bearing fruit. So therefore, you're not going to continue. Disciples don't know it, but the tree withers, starts withering right at that moment. I mean, it basically, it died at that moment. Peter looks at the tree the next day as they're, the next day now, as they're walking into Jerusalem again. This is after the day that Jesus has cleared out the temple, uh, and he's, they're walking in, and, and he says, oh my, look, there's the tree that you, you prayed over. It's dead, Jesus. Wow. 
must have been some pretty strong insecticide or pesticide or whatever that he used or um, something, <laughs> some chemical, you know, that, that killed it in a day, right? It's gone. The tree is totally dead. And it's obvious even to the disciples. But there's something more to this, and don't miss, don't miss this. That when Jesus was dealing with the fig tree, he was really trying to teach a lesson to Jerusalem. And the lesson was the same thing that he had said when he was there in the temple when he cleared it out. My house shall be known as a house of prayer. The temple is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. It's where all people should be able to come and know God. And if you're going to be a follower of mine, you should be a fruit-bearing tree. You should be helping all nations, anyone, to come to believe and know Jesus Christ. Same thing is true for us, that he was wanting for them. And the question we need to ask ourselves as we first look at this text, which abruptly kind of jumps on, but not really. Because suddenly Jesus says, have faith. Why? Because Jesus is concerned, are we being fruitful? And so as we first look at this text today, you need to ask yourself a question. Are we being fruitful? Are you being fruitful? Are you a, or are you a really nice, pretty green tree? Lots of, lots of leaves out there. But no fruit. You can look nice. You all look nice, by the way. Yeah. Did you know I have purple in your hair? Okay, just. <laughs> you all look nice, but, but God's not concerned about how you look, is he? God's looking inside your heart, and God's looking at your life, and he's saying, are you being fruitful for my kingdom? In Matthew, Jesus, right in the same context, tells a parable to try to help them to understand what happened with the fig tree. And he tells the parable of the wicked tenants. And these were guys who were taking care of some property for the master. And the master starts sending people to, pick his, to get his rent. And they decide, we're not going to give you the rent money. We're going to keep it for ourselves. And they start killing off people who are coming to get the rent. Ultimately, the master sends his son. The son dies. And finally, the master comes and says, you wicked people. And he judges them and takes the property away and has them destroyed. Why? Verse 43, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce fruit. And that's what Jesus is about to do with Jerusalem. So let's be serious about it. Are we fruitful? Are we a house of prayer for all nations? Are we taking care of what God has put in our hands? A, a, next question. How big is your God? Your God. How big is God? Jesus makes this very simple statement. He says, have faith in God. Is your God big enough that if you take him a problem, he can take care of it? Is your God big enough that if you ask him a question, he can respond? Is your God big enough that he can hear you from heaven? Or is he like the prophets of Baal had to deal with when Elijah was saying, you know, hey, you know, pray to, your, to, your, to, your, to Baal and have him you know, burn the rocks of fire. And, 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 and he has fun with this one because he's, you know, well, your God must be sleeping. So cry out louder. He can't hear you. Maybe he's away on a journey. How big is your God? Is your God so big that he's away on a journey, he can't take care of you? He's sleeping, he can't take time to, to listen and respond to you? How big is your God? Jesus is going to, in this text, use an interesting little phrase.
Truly, truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that they say will happen, it will be done for them. Did you know that that was a common phrase that teachers would use? Teachers would talk about the fact of the, that they could move mountains by their teaching. James 1, 6, 8 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the, a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. The word there for doubting is the same word as the word disputing. In fact, James chapter 2, verse 4 says, Have you not discriminated disputed among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Jude 1 9 says, but even the archangel when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses did not himself dare to condemn him for slander but said the Lord rebuke you. Jesus says, don't doubt. Don't dispute. Do you ever get an argument with yourself? I'm always wondering who wins when you do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, look, don't get in, a, in a, an argument with yourself. Don't be disputing with yourself. You must believe. But I appreciate what the father of the young man who had the demon, Jesus is coming down from this incredible high where he's just met with Moses and Elijah. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. They get down to the bottom of the mountain and the disciples are there and there's an argument going on because they haven't been able to cast out this demon and the religious people are there and it's a big fiasco. And, and finally the man comes to him and says, please, can you, if you, if you can, could you heal my son, Jesus? What do you mean, if I can? How big's your God? If he can, can your God do? miraculous, the powerful, beyond what you can think or imagine? How big is your God? And, Jesus, and the man responds to Jesus, uh, Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's what we need to be praying. Jesus, I believe, but help, help my unbelief. Incidentally, I, I also appreciate what John MacArthur said in this context. He says, your faith has no power. Your words spoken in faith have zero power. That's a deception. God has all the power. Your faith is only a way to activate God's power within the framework of his purpose. It's not how powerfully you pray. It's how powerful God is. It's not what you can convince God to do because you're so wonderful. It's how much God wants to do for you. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. You realize this? When we pray, we get to go to the throne of God. We get to enter the most holy of holy places. And too many of us go in there with pretty dirty feet. It says that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. And there was a very important phrase there, wasn't it? If we ask anything according to his will. And how do you know what that is? Well, you just kind of put it on as a magical phrase and it'll work, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so there, God, I want your will done. Now, could you give me dot, dot, dot? How do you know it's his will? <laughs> Ask him. Matthew, speaking to the same issue of doubt, says he replied, Matthew 17, 20, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. How much faith do you have to have? Well, you got to have faith like a Billy Graham, right? you you got you to gotta have faith like a Peter, like a Paul. you you got to have faith like the children of Israel and Moses when they broke down the walls of Jericho, right? No, no. How much faith do you have to have? 
A mustard seed is really, really, really tiny. Most of us <laughs> have more faith than the size of a mustard seed. And with that faith, we can move mountains. And the faith is not us, it's God. James 4 goes on and says, You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Are you praying to know what God's will is? Or are you praying, my will be done, God? Incidentally, in this text, Jesus is about to move a mountain. In fact, he's in the middle of the week and he is getting ready to move the, one of the most important mountains of all time. And it's a lot bigger mountain than anything that we see physically. It's bigger than, way bigger than Mount of Olives. It's bigger than Mount Hermon because it's the mountain of breaking down hell and setting people free. It's a mountain of of religious thinking that is in the way and he's going to start something brand new through him. A fulfillment of everything that's been taught through Israel. He's going to now move that mountain to now faith in him and what he's going to do on the cross. It's an incredible mountain. Jesus says, if you have faith, you can move, say to this mountain, it will move. And that's what Jesus is thinking about. I mean, this whole week, in fact, the last six months, it's almost everything that's on Jesus' mind is about, I'm heading to Jerusalem. Guys, I'm going to die there on a cross. I'm going to rise from the dead. Why? Because I'm coming to move a mountain. I'm sorry. just seems kind of an exciting thing. Ask. And believe what Jesus says. Verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Okay, let's see. I just saw an advertisement, uh, was it this morning or last night? Did you know that they have a beautiful red Jaguar? Oh, this thing's cool looking, okay? Sporty looking, and sometimes Jags don't look so sporty, but this one's sporty looking. I love the red color. You know what? Why don't you all ask for that red jag for me? <laughs> now, if I was really going to preach it, I'd ask you all to pay, give me the money so I could buy it, right, Mac? <laughs> Mac? <laughs> John 14. Incidentally, let's move into John 14, 15, and 16 just for a few moments. And I want you to remember that this is the, con the context of this. Jesus is having his last meal with his disciples. Jesus is trying to talk to them about what's really important. Notice, that's what this, this whole text even is about today. Even as Jesus is coming in back into Jerusalem, he's trying to say, guys, I still need to teach you about prayer. I still need to have you understand how important, how powerful, how valuable this tool is, and you need to make use of it. Well, when you get to John 14, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 12, he that believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, he will do also in greater works, greater in extent, not kind, than these he will do because I go to my Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Guys, I'm getting ready to die. I'm going to that cross. I'm not going to be here with you much longer. In fact, it's only a couple of days. Then I'm going to come back and when I rise from the dead, I'm going to spend a little time with you, but then I'm getting out of here and the Holy Spirit's coming and guys, you got to be ready for the time when I'm not here. You see, these guys have been a little bit spoiled. No, seriously. The disciples have been kind of spoiled. Because what, what do they do if they're going to talk to God? Jesus. I mean, he's like right there. <laughs> well, Jesus, why did you do that? <laughs> Jesus, do you, know, you want to heal this man? Jesus, can you cast out the demon of this man? Jesus, why couldn't we cast it out? He's right there for them to talk to. God's right in front of them. Wait a second. Wait a second. Where's God right now? <laughs> Guys, I'm getting ready to leave. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit back. God's going to be with you. 
all times. But I got to help you remember that he's there with you. I got to help you understand that you can talk to him just like you've been talking to me now. And you're going you're to be able to do it through me, through my power, through the authority that I'm giving to you, he says. And so he goes on. Verse, verse 7 of chapter 15. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Guys, if you're really listening to me, you'll know what I want. Could I have that red jet? Come on, does it sound as stupid to you as it does to me? But I don't mind if you all want to put the money down for it. See, if I'm really, it says if I'm really living with Jesus, abide. If I'm really getting next to him, if I'm really listening to him, if I'm really trying to understand what he wants, then, then I'll know what to ask for because I'm that close to him. Verse 16 of chapter 15. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. Your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of my Father in my name, he may give it to you. What do you think really matters to Jesus? I think it's the same thing that mattered to him when he said, my house is a house of prayer. And what really matters to him, it mattered to him when he saw that tree that bare no fruit. What really matters to him, the same thing he's been talking about in this text more than once. I'm calling you to bear fruit. That's what matters to Jesus. Verse, chapter 16, verse 23 and 24. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Notice it does say, and, and you're going to get just, you know, all kinds of stuff. Tons of stuff. Riches and wealth and, you know, tons of things, you know. No, what does he say? The thing that you get that's best of all, your joy will be complete. You'll be fulfilled. <laughs> and, and notice, not just you'll be happy. Yay, I got that red jag. Oh, it broke down. Could somebody pay to fix it? By the way, if you're going to buy it for me, make sure that you have a plan for that, too, because I can afford <laughs> to, to, to fix it. Okay. So I'm going to need you to pay for that also. And maybe pay the taxes and, and the insurance and, you know, just, just plan ahead if you're going to do that, okay? And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, Forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. When you stand praying. Well, one of the times that they would stand is they're in the temple just praying to God. Or they're going to the temple and they have a need. They have sins to confess and, and they're just confessing it. So there's all different kinds that you would stand praying. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Forgive so you can be forgiven. Here's something, and I don't remember if I caught this from my own words, whatever, but you can't serve the God of bitterness and the God of love at the same time. And one of the things we need to stop and ask ourselves is have we offended God? Because when we're holding on to our own sin or the sin of someone else, we're offending God. Matthew put it this way when he was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount where we get the, the, the heart of the disciples' prayer from. He says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. But if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also for forgive you. If you don't forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Here's your choice. Hold a grudge against somebody else or have God answer your prayers. Which one do you want? <laughs> Maintain that animosity, that hostility you have towards any other person or forgive and have God respond to you. What do you desire? I guess the question is, are you praying with a heart after God?
you praying with a heart after God? Jesus was doing this teaching on prayer because it matters to him. He wants us to listen and open our hearts. Let's pray. I'd like you, as you go to prayer right now, I'd like you to pray individually. If you want to stand and do, do it that way, which like uh, some of the good Jews were doing, you can do that. If you want to kneel, you can do that. If you want to just sit there like you are, you can do that. But I'd like you to talk to God about you. And maybe you want to ask him two questions. Jesus, what do I need? And the second question, Jesus, am I listening? The I was you, not Bill. <laughs> okay. Jesus, what do I need? Jesus, am I listening?